Today I'm going to talk about um, Docker containers and how we can use them to enhance the reproducibility of our work. Um, and you know, as as always, feel free to stop me uh, if you have any questions. Either um, type something into the chat or use that little raised hand, raise hand, and and turn your mic on and ask ask a question at, as you wish. So it. A major theme in this course has been about reproducible research, um, which I, I guess I could define this way, arranged sort of like a poem, that we organize the data and code in a way you can hand it to someone else. They can rerun the code and get the same results, the same figures and tables. That um, sounds simple, but it can be um, difficult. It requires us to um, sort of day by day in a project to maintain that um, that that focus on keeping things organized and and well documented, so that in the future, should someone want to um, rerun our code and to to check that it'll be arranged for them in a way that they can do so easily. One one piece that I haven't talked about is what has been called dependency hell of thinking about the all of the things that <clears throat> the code in your project depends on and that someone might need to install in order to run your code. You know, so your work is reproducible if you can hand the if you package the data and code in a way that you can hand it to someone else and they can rerun it. But so they get your zip file and unzip it. What other things do they need to install? What other assumptions have you made for them to actually run that code? Have you and have you made it explicit? So things like um, you know the particular operating system that you're using. Does does any aspect of your of your code require that it match? Um, system libraries that you're depending on, you know, numerical libraries or scientific libraries or that sort of thing, the particular version of R or Python, or just the fact that you're requiring that they have R or a Python available, all of the sets of packages or modules or other things, you know, all the R packages that you're using, all the Python modules that you're using, has it been, is it, I mean, how how much work is it to identify which ones that the the user needs to install, um, and what other tools are you relying on? You know, if I'm if I'm making a PDF document using R Markdown, the user will not only need Pandoc installed, but also LaTeX, which can be, um, you know, quite a bear. Um, It can't, I mean, so can a user that's interested in your work install all those dependencies, have the dependencies change so that they really need to look back at particular versions and have you documented the versions that you used? And how much time is it going to take them to set all this up? And it, you know, if it's going to take them an afternoon um, to get those Python modules installed in the right way, um, they're going to be less willing to really even dig into your code any further. Um, so, you know, part of it is just the barriers that are set up in order to try to rerun your code. But, and part of it is, is, um, you know, have you documented things in a way, you know, that if particular past versions of, of packages are needed, is it, um, Will you be able to reconstruct that um, five or or ten or fifteen years later, should you want to? So one way to capture those kinds of dependencies is using these virtual environment sort of tools. In R, um, R show makes this this R package called R Conf. Ronf. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. R, um, 
environment is really what it stands for where in a given project you run our, you know run this init and then install a bunch of packages and at some point take a snapshot and it um somehow create it, it puts local it installs copies of packages locally within your project as part of your project so then when you distribute your project with um when you distribute your project to someone it includes not just um, your code and your data, but also all the packages that you're depending on, at least our packages. And a related really interesting development is this MRAN. So I think you're all aware of CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, um, sort of a, a repository of R packages going back um, where they, they keep old versions of packages. MRAN is a, a Microsoft effort, the Microsoft R archive network. They're basically taking daily snapshots of the of CRAN. So you can use MRAN and say, you know, install these packages as they existed on this particular date, you know, 2000 or um, November 12th in in 2018, give me the versions of the packages that were there then. So you can focus on the date at which you ran the code and not think about the specific versions of packages that you happen to have. Um, can, it can be really um, useful. For Python, I think, I you know, I'm not super familiar with Python, but I think that in a Conda, has been a super useful tool for helping to install complicated, um, you know, groups of, of um, Python modules that, and you can create different environments, install packages within each of those environments and, um, and share those environments with other, other, with your collaborators. So if you may have some project that needs Python 2 from a particular, you know, old version, and you can, you know, switch to that um, that, that Python environment, and then switch back for a different project. So, can I, if I can chime in really quick with Conda, I mean, it's widely used to share environments. Like, if you go onto GitHub and try to download somebody's research code, they they might have a Conda like environment file in there that you can download as well to set up your environment. Mm -hmm. But there's a big caveat in that those files, uh, you don't necessarily need to specify the version of each package. So some of them, they'll like specify the version of NumPy, but not TensorFlow. And you mm -hmm. end up installing the environment and things don't work anyways, because you don't have the right versions. Right. So they, I guess they could specify a particular environment, I mean, a particular version, but they tend not to. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, yeah. they can they can do it, but um, and yeah, so um, so some of these tools are that. Thanks very much for that comment. Some of these tools they can be used to fully specify the environment, it's, it's, but it's it's often left to the user to make some aspects of that explicit, and it's often at the time, not obvious which things you need to make explicit and which you don't. I think that um, that this last line, conda end list minus minus explicit, I think it ends up printing out exactly the version numbers that are there so that you could reconstruct, um, you know, from that information, the exact environment. But, yeah, so, and Python 3 has this vomv that's, I guess, similar to ROMV. It makes a virtual environment. So Conda is a general tool that's not just Python, but it could be used to keep track of, you know, everything about your your software system, whereas vomv is, is a built-in Python 3 thing that's specific to Python. Um, So, um, so bo both of these tools, they, they could meet our needs, but they, they require um, th um, some care. 
another approach is to turn your pack, turn your, your, your data analysis project into a formal package and use the packaging system to define the, all of the dependencies. So, you know, if you have an R data analysis project that you could take all of the functions that you've created and put them into a pack an R package and in the description file for that package, you would then define the set of, of packages that you're depending on. And you could, um, in principle, ref well, you, you could point to the particular versions that you're using at the time. And so then when your if someone installs your package to try to redo their analysis, they would get the, you know, an attempt to, to install all the specific versions of packages that you def define there in that description file. You could include with in your package all the data that you're using. Um, traditionally in this like int subdirectory in ext underscore data. And you could your analyses you could you could include as vignettes. Um, and again, I, I should admit that I my Python knowledge is limited, but I think you know you can make a Python package with multiple um, modules and and a, you know a setup sort of file um, and you could define dependencies on other packages again just like in the R package I, the dependencies here typically just saying use these other packages and aren't explicit about the exact version but they the I think the tools are such that you could um, be explicit about specific old versions. And for if you're doing this for long term reproducibility, that would be something that you well, that I would recommend that you do. Um, but that and that brings us to the topic of the day. Docker um, is really the 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 recommended tool that gets around the the difficulties I've mentioned the the difficulties with these sort of hand constructed approaches. I've been um, slow to the the Docker container revolution, um, but. As, as, as I understand it, Docker containers are like little virtual machines. So, um, you know, a, a pretend computer running within your current computer. Um, so, you know, if you, your experience with, say, um, VirtualBox or other um, tools for making virtual machines that allow you to run, you know, Windows within a window on your Mac or to run Linux within a window on your your Windows machine. Um, Docker containers are sort of like that. What's what's different about these Docker containers is that they're very lightweight. Um, are sort of ra rather than be rather containing a full operating system, they make use of the host machine's um, operating system to run. So whereas you know, if you if you tried to fire up two or three virtual box, you know, virtual machines on your laptop, you would quickly um, everything would want to everything would be grinding to a halt. With these Docker containers, you can have a hundred of them running at the same time on a on a desktop machine and not and 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 it'll work okay. And it's because they're not all like trying to be the whole be a whole computer they're sharing um they're 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 smaller and they're and they're 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 smaller than a full virtual machine as i understand it um the uh, the they all um, are running something that looks like linux i mean well it's running you know a, a virtual version of linux um and making use of a host machine's linux so on Mac and Windows, they end up um, you you somehow have a, a separate virtual machine that's running Linux, and that these little Docker containers are running 
within that separate virtual machine. Um, they've, I, the last couple of years, that's been made a lot easier. So you, you install on Mac or Windows, you install one um, sort of desktop application, Docker desktop application, and then can go to a terminal window in on the Mac or in Windows and use Docker the same way that you use it when on Linux. Um, and you don't really notice that it's different. Um, but so that the the thing that's useful for the well so these these docker containers have been useful for um kind of software development projects generally or sort of um putting up you know web apps onto servers different places because it sort of contains everything in one little thing and you just and it sort of rather than think about the details of the nature of the servers that you're working with you just think about these little mini containers that are like mini computers lightweight computers um for us for reproducibility they capture all the dependencies in a project down to the operating system so you can you make one of these Docker containers that contains your data and your code, but also contains the specific versions of all the packages that you needed to use and it, the specific version of R and, you know, on the specific operating system that you were using, um, you capture everything in this container and then you can hand that to, to someone else and you're handing them not just your data and your code, but the entire aspect of everything that you're relying on. Um, so you can, you can make a snapshot, sort of a binary file that has a snapshot of everything that you're using for your analysis, and you can pass that to someone else and they can, they've installed, um, Docker, the, um, the desktop application, and they can fire up your little Docker, can, your image, create a, a, of working instance of that as a Docker container and be able to play with your data and code immediately without having to spend a bunch of time installing stuff. Um, and that there's also um, these sort of text-based or sort of script recipes for creating the image. So the binary image, the, typically they're like, you know, a gigabyte you know, they're pretty big things because it contains, you know, a snapshot of everything that you need to run your code. Um, but there are also little scripts for creating um, the, the image um, that, are, um, that are really small and easy to hand, hand around and human readable that, you know, you can see what someone did to make that Docker container. Um, and those text-based recipes can be built starting from some previous one. So you find someone else has made a Docker container, you know, an image of a Docker container that um, has almost everything that you want, except you need to install a few extra R packages. You start from that one and then just do a couple more things. Um, to, to get started using Docker, um, the first thing to do is download and install Docker. Um, go to docker.com, install the, the desktop application for Windows or Mac. Or if you're on Linux, you, um, you in, install it in the, the usual way. Um, and then further, get an account on this hub.docker.com, which is kind of the, it's like the, it's like the GitHub for Docker containers. So... You know, GitHub is this repository of Git repositories, and Docker, this Docker Hub is the the repository of Docker images. Um, so, I mean, to, just to to try to make concrete again some of the terms that I'm throwing around. So a, a Docker container is the kind of running Docker thing. You have um, a little virtual machine or a sort of scaled down virtual machine running on your computer. 
you call that thing as it's running a container. Um, an image is like a, a binary file that has a snapshot of one of those containers at a specific time. So you can, um, you know, run that image and it will create a, that, a, create a container or you can make a hundred containers, all copies of a single image. Um, and a Docker file is this sort of text-based script, the recipe for making a new container. So you you take this Docker file and you build it, it'll make this image file. And then from that, you can make as many containers as you want of it. For those of us using R, the place to go um, is this project called Rocker which was an effort um, to make Docker containers for users of R. You can run these locally. Um, and many of them, they have R studios are sort of built in. So you run, you, you make, have this container running locally and you can go to the web browser to interact with it. Um, you have R studio server running in the web browser. Um, if you want to look at, Rocker and the various sets of images that that they have created. You could go to in the the Docker Hub to their Rocker user section. It has um, these Docker images of different sizes. Um, they also have their own web page that describes the project more completely, and then they have a GitHub page that really has kind of the recipes that they. I mean, the it has the the detailed sort of behind the scenes stuff that both make their web page and make all these Docker containers. Um, and that once you've installed Docker and you have um, an account on the Docker hub, you use this Docker pull command to pull a particular image down to your computer and then Docker run to fire up a container based on that image. For the, the, the one that I'm going to start with is this rocker slash RStudio that is um, got R running and RStudio running. And if you can, if when, you, when we fire this up, we'll be able to um, open it in a web browser and interact with it. It, it requires that we set a password. Um, the password can be anything, but this minus E. So Docker run will run, um, take a, a Docker image and create a container, a running container of it. Um, the minus E um, sets an environment variable. So we're going to set a password variable that is, you know, whatever we want to use as a password. And the second thing we need to tell it is the port, sort of a number that lets us get into the container um, in the web browser to to play with our studio. You'll see that in a moment. I'll come back to this second bit in a minute. Um, but So here I'm sharing just um, my terminal window. If I type Docker, um, pull rocker r studio it will go to the web to the, to uh, it will go to the web and attempt to download that thing and if i've already downloaded it it will compare the thing i downloaded to the version that's on the web and only download it if necessary um, i'm running on my laptop is running on linux and so i need to use sudo to sort of give me um, root privileges to run this Docker command. I think there's a way to get around using sudo every single time, but every time I use Docker, I'm going to use sudo docker. Um, on, a, on, a, on my Mac, I don't need to do that. I can just say docker pull our rocker our studio. Um, so if I had not already done this, it would download that thing. But I, since I've already done it, it says um, status image um, image up to date. 
I don't need to I don't need to redo it. I could pull down a different one. Um, I think they they have a they have a an image that's called verse that has R plus the tidyverse packages installed. And the the way that these these Docker images work, they have different layers uh, that can be shared between different images. Um, so a bunch of these layers for this rocker verse I've, are part of the package that I've already downloaded or that the Docker image I've already downloaded. So it doesn't download those and it just downloads these last two layers. But as you can see, they're pretty big. They're each, um, you know, a third of a gig and almost half a gig. So unless you're on a really fast connection, they take a while to download and build. Um, but this Docker pull command will pull down a particular Docker image onto your computer. Um, because of the size of these, you probably don't want to pull down, I mean, un unless you have some amazing, um, amount of space on your computers, which I never seem to do. You you want to, I guess, be prudent about which ones you pull down. And I'll show you in a minute how to delete them afterwards. Um, but so to actually run this, we're going to do Docker run. Um, I need, for this particular RStudio one, I need to set this password. I'm going to set it to be um, rocker. And then I need to open this port. That'll allow me to connect to it in the browser. And then I say what it is, what image that I want to fire up. I got to get that right, Rocker R Studio. So this is this is the name of the image, Rocker R Studio. Um, this bit is the port that I need to open to be able to connect with it in the browser. This is saying I want to use this particular password. If I run this, um, it will get started. So now I'm going to switch to the I'm going to switch to the browser. And it should be here now in the browser that if I go to the um, if I go to localhost colon and then the name of that the, that particular port number, 8787, it will get me to this RStudio server. Um, so it's that Docker container is running in the background on my computer and um, it has RStudio server running and sort of accessible to me. And I can, I give it the password or the, the username is RStudio and the password is the rocker as I just said specified on the command line. I sign into this and I have a, a working RStudio running that's in that little container running in the background on my computer. Um, it, it is, I type installed packages. I can look to see, you know, what packages they actually have installed. Um, it's not a huge number sort of the, I would say the, kind of the, the basic things. Um, but we can, we can install additional packages, we can pass data into this, and we can do a variety of other things. Um, I will, I'll go back to my, um, Go back to my slides. For a second. Um, so this, so the doc, I mean, so Rocker can pr provides a bunch of Docker images that are set up for people that want to use R. The ones that I, I mean, many of them just have R installed. Some of them have R installed with a bunch of packages pre-installed. Um, and the, 
um, if you want to work with these interactively, you know, you can you can use images that have R Studio installed at this R Studio server, so that you can have the Docker container running on your running on your computer and interact with it through R Studio in a web browser. The so the for R um, for reproducibility purposes, I mean, we need to first get our data into this and then we also want to be able to install new packages and have them persist um, one way to get the to get the data get our data and code into this is um, is is to that you, there's an another command line flag for docker minus v that will um, connect a a directory on your hard drive to a directory inside um, the Docker container. So um, when you when you fire up the Docker container, the this these particular R Studio this R Studio container, um, you'll be in home slash R Studio because that home is sort of where user files end up being put in Linux and R Studio is the name is the username that you're going to be using inside this container. Um, so you can use your local directory um, where you're starting up the container and have that correspond to um, that directory in the container. So then all the files that are sitting in the directory where you're firing this up, you'll see inside the container on our studio and changes that you make in inside the container will be reflected in your local directory one other thing i want to point out is this 8787 port business it, you have to use that specific number it's that number is hard coded into this particular container um, if you wanted to use a different port or you um, you would need you wanted to fire this up with a different port, it seems like you would need to go back and totally change um, that image to be opening not the 8787 port, but something else. So with this particular, with this particular image with RStudio running in the browser, it seems like you can only have one of them running usefully on your computer at a time. But, um, Let me let me go back um, to the command line again. I'm just going to do Control C to halt this container, and I'm going to um, so I'm going to I'm in a directory here that has an R project and a just some lame R script. The R script just has a few lines of R in it that don't really do anything useful. And I'm just saying hello to myself a few times, but I'm just going to use that. Um, if I want, if I wanted access to those files within my Docker container, um, I could do so by adding to this line, say, minus V, PWD home R Studio. The, the, this PWD is a Linux command that prints the working directory. The dollar sign and parentheses around it, what so the Linux will run that PWD command to print my current directory and then paste it in here. So it just saves me the work of, of writing out the full directory. And then, so the part on the left is my local directory, the colon, and then the part on the right is that local directory will appear as this directory when we get into um, into the Docker container. So, um, so I run I run run Docker, tell it I want this local directory to go with that this directory within the container. I set the password, I open the port, and then I say what particular image I want to fire up. Um, 
I'll go back and share um, the my browser again. If I if I refresh this, um, it'll say it crashed. Um, but it'll, it will get me into, it, it will sort of fire up a new instance of our studio that's running with, um, it'll see, it'll see that project and it'll have this, you know, our project and it'll open up that file for me immediately. Um, you know, so I can, you know, run this code as I wish and I can add additional code. Um, and save it. So I mean, so so that that minus v option make con, um, connects a local directory on your hard drive with a directory within the container, so that when you fire up the container, you have access to all those local files. And as we'll see in a second, those um, if we go if I go back to um, I'm going to kill this container again. I, so the the changes that I made when I was running the container get reflected in my local files here. So that is one way to pass data and code between your local hard drive and to get that into the container to work with. I don't understand what this kitematic directory is but um on that that rocker image the r studio image has this um has this kitematic directory in there it seems to be empty but you you kind of you're stuck with that it it has that in there on that automatically for you i let's go back to the files to the i'll go back to the my slides again So Docker, um, you have you can you have these images that you can fire up, and you'll have a specific version of R with specific packages installed. And this Rocker project gives you versions that have R Studio Server running in them, which you can um, have running in the background. And when you fire it up, you can interact with that thing in the web browser, and you can. Um, so you could pass that to a friend and they'd be able to work with your data in the same way that you were. They would, they would get the full R and all packages. Um, they could more easily get it on their computer with, they need to just install Docker and get this image going. Um, for those of you interested in Python and, and Jupyter Notebooks, we have, um, there's the same sort of effort for, um, for Jupyter with Docker containers. I think the place to go is is on this Docker hub to look at the Jupyter user. Um, they have a, a variety of nope of um, sort of pre-built Docker images um, for different uses, you know, that have say NumPy and SciPy installed already, or um, that well that have you know different different environments already set up for you. We're just going to look at um, this minimal notebook that all it has is the Jupyter notebook and sort of the, um, the Python itself running. Um, we can pull that down from, um, from the Docker hub and then we can run it. We can, we can connect our local directory to some directory inside that container for reasons that I don't understand, the username is Joy or Jove Yan. Um, I don't know if that's an actual person or if that's some sort of word that's related to Jupiter in some way. Um, you need to give it a specific port 
and then you tell it, I want to fire up a container based on this image, this minimal notebook image for Jupyter. The port here needs to be 8888. And I think that is um, specific to the port that's inside that was defined in this image. Um, but le um, let me try that. If I go, if I go back to my terminal. So if I do um, Docker pull Jupyter minimal notebook, it could potentially take a while um, downloading a gigabyte kind of image from the web, but because I've already done it, it sees that the image that I have is matches what's on the web, so it doesn't have to download anything. Um, then, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move back to a different directory. So I'm moving to a directory that has a single sort of test Python notebook in it. A, a Jupyter it has a Jupyter notebook in it. Um, so I want to run um, with m this local directory. Being viewed as home, Joe Yan, I think. And give it this port 888, 888. And then um, this is the image I want to use this minimal notebook. Now for Jupyter, um, rather than a password, it wants me to use this um, this website with this specific token. Um, let's. So if I, you know, if I open that um, website with that specific token in my my web browser, it. Um, You'll see that I have now, so I'm going to switch to the browser. I have this, you know, Jupyter notebooks running and the available notebooks are exactly, you know, that local directory. So my local notebooks get, get viewed in this. Um, so I have this Docker container that has Python running Jupyter and it has um, my local notebook sitting there. So I can open that up and you'll find um, that I didn't put a whole lot of effort into this, um, but say I did, um, I de define a, an a array in, in, in Python and I can, you know, run it and, I can I can create a full notebook, you know, with and data files and and work with them in Jupyter with a you know particular set of of Python modules pre-installed if it, as I as I wish. Um, let me go back now to our slides. Um, so, so other people have already set up all the hard work of, um, making, you know, Docker images with R and, and Python and, you know, all this stuff that we might want and, um, that we can use as sort of the basis for our own work. So for a given project that we want to distribute, we have code and data organized in a nice way. We want um, to make our own Docker image that has our code and our data in it and um, pat, you know, pass that around to others. The, the place to start um, is, is you want to, you know, start from some previous image, find, you know, look at that Docker hub and find an image that has most of the stuff you want, but, um, and 
you know, that someone else has already created and work from there. Then there are really two ways to, to define your, your um, Docker image from that. You can use the, this Docker file, which is sort of a text-based explicit script that's human readable, shows exactly what you did to make the thing. Um, and it's some, something that'll be really small. Or you can create a container inter interactively and then write it to an image file. Um, you can use Docker copy to copy stuff into the container. Um, and then ultimately you'll do Docker commit to save that container to an image file. And then you can use and Docker push to upload it to the, the Docker hub for others to, to work from. So I'll show you a little bit about each of those. Um, start with um, how to create an, a new Docker image that you want. So say I, I wanted to create an image that um, had RStudio running, but also had my RQTL package in it. And it also had, um, and to had my data, of, you know, some data of mine. So I could, you know, I download this doc, this RStudio image, I fire it up, and then inside there, I could run install.packages to install my RQTL package. I could download files and, and put them there in the working directory. Um, and so then I would have, I would have an instance of a Docker container that you know was based on this R Studio one, but had additional package or in packages installed and had additional um, data files in there. And I could also put, you know, R scripts or R Markdown um, documents in there as well. And then, I guess one other thing that I did here is that I um, I used this minus minus name to give the the running container a specific name. Because otherwise I have to work with these hash kind of codes that are kind of confusing. This Docker commit, what that does is um, sort of takes a snapshot of that running container and saves it to a binary image file. So it, it looks for this particular snap running container and saves it to this particular file. Um, I then, you know, for reasons that I don't totally understand, need to sort of tag that. I, um, I, I figure out what is the name of that image file that I have. And I'm going to tag that specific version of that Docker image um, and then push it to the web using this. So these three um, lines end up with on, on that Docker hub, if you go to the user K Broman, you'll find this particular image and you could download it yourself. So then I can tell my friend, do Docker pull K Broman RStudio underscore RQTL and they'll get that image that I made. For, um, so the, the other approach is to make a Docker file. This is an an example Docker file um, for um, making a Docker container that's running a Minecraft server. Well, running a Minecraft server that has this um, ras um, has this Raspberry Juice plugin that allows us to interact with the with the Minecraft game using R. So I I happen to have this this Docker file sitting on my hard drive. And so I use this as an example, but you know, a typical Docker file, I don't know how well you can read this cause it's kind of a lot of, this is the entire Docker file, but it starts with this from Java. So what that's saying is that um, first uses Java container, which is a Docker image, a Docker image that has Java pre-installed. It's to run Minecraft for the to run the Minecraft game to run the Minecraft a Minecraft server, we need to have Java installed, and so we're going to start with that as our Docker container. Um, 
And then it has all these run commands, which are, you know, sort of, it's telling it, fire up this Java image and then run, make a directory slash Minecraft, um, download this, um, download this particular sort of build tool for making Minecraft. Um, change into the directory and and sort of build that Java file. Um, blah de blah all the way down. Um, the set of run commands to make basically all the things that you would need to do to install this Minecraft server on in a in a Linux environment. We then need to open explicit ports so that people can get access to the game. Um, and then finally, um, this command bit is, so these, the, the run commands at the top are all things that get run when the, you know, the very first time sort of setting up this image. The command one at the bottom is every time a container for the, of this image started, starts run this one command. You know, so if we were going to make a, you know, an R-based thing, we would put, um, we would use run commands that installed specific R packages, but then at the end, um, I think we would could probably base it on, you know, some other package that would fire up R Studio as soon as it runs. So an, another example to look at is this R Studio. Um, image that I that I looked at before. Um, let me let me switch to the web again. So if I go to um, GitHub. Rocker, um, rocker.org, I guess, rocker version. So that, this is their GitHub repository the, the, for these various, um, you know, Docker containers. If we go into this um, RStudio directory, it has um, the Docker files to fire um, for, for this, the Docker file that's kind of the basis for that RStudio um, image that we were look using before. So it has at the top, um, it's, you know, start with this, you know, this Docker image that has R version 3.6.3 installed, the latest version of R. Um, define a bunch of arguments and environmental variables, and then um, you know, run this stuff down here, um, which is, I guess, installing RStudio server and getting it into the right place. And then at the very end, um, running some init script. And you see here it exposes port 8787. So if you wanted to this, if you wanted the same RStudio, um, an R Studio Docker container, but with a different port, you would take this Docker file and change the 8787 to, to whatever other port you wanted and then re and then build a new thing from it. Here you can see this Kitematic business. I don't know what this is, but they are, I guess are creating that directory here, Kitematic. Um, which must be something that people want, so they put it there for those people that want it. Let me go um, go back to my slides. Um, so to man to manage Docker stuff, so on on your hard drive, you're going to have different images. Um, Docker images, a Docker image LS, those that will show you what images that you have installed. 
um, Docker PS and doc minus A or container LS minus A, that'll show you what containers that you have running or sort of suspended. You can use container stop and container start to um, take those containers that are sort of suspended and get them going again or take a current one and put it in the background. Um, Docker RM to remove a container, Docker image RM to remove a particular um, image. Let me, let me show this in action on my computer. Um, if I, if I go back to the terminal, shut down that Jupyter notebook that was running. So if I do Docker images, I do pseudo Docker images. So pseudo Docker images shows the set of images that I've installed that I have a Minecraft image. I have the Rocker R Studio, the Rocker Verse, the Minimal Notebook, and this the one that I made myself, which is R Studio with my RQTL package installed within it. Um, if I wanted to, if I did Docker image RM, um, I, if I wanted to remove that um, verse one, I do Docker image remove rocker slash verse. Um, then if I do Docker images again, you'll see I that is a way to to delete one of them. Which you know, given that it was kind of huge, it, um, useful to save give me back some space. Docker. Um, PS minus A will show um, what containers I have running. So I had an, a, an RStudio container, um, a couple of RStudio containers that I fired up and then exited, and then that Jupyter notebook that I fired up and then exited. And these are names, they, it gives them um, Sort of random names it assigns. That is like some adjective underscore the name, the last name of some person. So if I if I wanted to kill one of these images, um, I could do sudo docker rm practical nash, and then that it would um, delete that thing. And this, um, I could do, if I do sudo docker psaq, so this psaq um, lists all stopped containers. And then if I do that in dollar sign in parentheses, that's sort of a Linux command to replace that with, um, with the, the output. And so this will remove, basically remove all the containers that I have stopped. So that command um, gets rid of all the containers that I don't need. Get rid of all containers, which I do because I don't need them anymore. Um, so let's see. So um, Docker containers can encapsulate the full, everything that you need potentially for your project, not just your code and your data, but all of the packages and the operating system and the, the R or other compilers that you need for your project. And, and you, can, you can work with these, you know, RStudio in a web browser or a Jupyter Notebook in a web browser in the same way that you, you are working generally, you know, completely interactively. So you could, it probably best practice for us would be that we just all start doing everything within Docker containers. And then at the end of our project, we take, we create an image of that Docker container, upload it to the hub, and we 
point people just to, you know, gra you, you say, here's not just my data and my code, but also the entire environment that I was working in. I have a snapshot of it as a Docker image that you can restore to life and run on your local computer. Um, and I, I think, so I think, you know, cutting edge folks that really want their, um, their analyses to be fully reproducible, that's what they're doing. Everything is within Docker containers and they don't do anything outside of a con one of these Docker containers anymore. You, you may think of Docker containers as you fire them up on Amazon Web Services and they're sitting there in AWS on some distant cloud-based thing and you don't actually interact with them directly. But you can also do the same thing, just everything locally. And that's probably the best way to get started in about these in sort of incorporating Docker into your, your, your normal life. In between there, I want to just shout, give a quick shout out to this binder um, effort. So if you go to mybinder.org, um, this is some kind of, um, miraculous it, it sort of effort to um, make it so that if you just add a couple files to your GitHub repository, that this mybinder.org will automatically turn it into a Docker container running in the cloud. So if you have, if you've, you know, you already have a project that is reproducible you know, data and code inside a GitHub repository. By just adding um, a runtime.txt file that says what is the date of R that you're using, or I think for Python or Jupyter, you have to tell it something slightly different. And then an install.r um, file that says these are the, that just has a bunch of install.packages calls that says, these are the set of packages I need you to install. You put those two files within your GitHub repository. And then if you go to, um, you go to a special URL and you put Earl path equals R studio at the end of it, um, my binder will go to your GitHub repository and um, what will it do? It'll download a Docker container. It'll install all the packages that you did It'll, it'll grab your GitHub repository and, um, and, and then f put it all in a web browser for you um, with RStudio running. I have a couple examples of this. Um, I have a, a blog post where I, I first tried this out and showed how to turn one of my GitHub repositories into something that you can look at from Binder. And then secondly, I have a repository um, that um, for some teaching materials I did at a meeting last year in June or so in 2019 um, that has both um, a Jupyter notebook and an RStudio sort of instant instance um, with teaching materials. Let me just... Um, Let's see if we can see that last, um, take a look at that last one. Go back to my browser. If I go to K Broman um, teaching CDC 2019. Um, so th this is a, a GitHub repository that has um, an R markdown document and kind of the same material in an, a Jupyter notebook. Um, and then uh, what I added to this was this runtime.txt file that says this is the date of R and R packages that I want to use. And this install.r package, which says, um, which has, this is a bunch of code that you need to run in order to get the, the when, you, when you first run the Docker container. Um, So that 
describe so th those aren't don't give specific versions but i think i could have made that code such that it would pull specific versions of packages um so i can if i click on this particular url mybinder.org that points to um, github and my particular user that particular repository and then um, it will open up our studio um, in a docker container with all of this material um, from that github repository so i can open up that um, our markdown document and i I should have um, you know all those various packages are already installed within our studio in this in this case um, I guess um and then I, and i I also made it so that it can fire up a Jupyter notebook in the same way. So I click on that URL, you know, my binder again, but at the end it says um, file path and points to that particular Jupyter notebook. It will then um, fire up a Docker container with Jupyter running with R and have this sort of live um, version of, of uh, my Jupyter notebook with all of my packages installed and the Jupyter thing run. So let, let me finally go back to my slides again. Um, so th this, um, my this binder is this effort to you just add a few little things to a github repository and it will do all the docker business for you in the cloud um i don't think you have a whole lot of computing power that it gives you and the very first time you fire up these containers it's pretty slow because it needs to download the docker image and turn it into a container and install R, install all these packages, and do all this stuff that you wanted, and then pull down GitHub. It takes a while to get going, but um, it then takes a snapshot of that. In some days, in the um, it runs really fast, as we saw, I think. But in so in summary, so reproducible research is you know you have organized your code and data in a way that you can hand it to someone else. They can rerun the code and get the same answers. Um, it just that part is has is difficult. Um, if you think about the all the packages that are required um, in other libraries and the version of R and so forth that that your code might be dependent on them, that it's really not so easy to just hand them the code and say here you go, run this and you should get the same answers. Um, and they and e even if they can do all those things to set up the environment to get your code running the way that you had um it's really quite it, it's quite a barrier to get someone to do it we want to lower that barrier so that they can so that someone else can more easily sort of jump in and look at your code and look at the data and and you know double check things or compare their own ideas or extend it to in other ways. Docker containers are really a um, hugely useful solution to that problem. Um, they're portable, shareable, extendable. Um, you can have these little Docker files that are just sort of text-based scripts um, that define how to create it. You know, the you know, specific Docker images have captured exact versions of everything. They're kind of big, but um, if you're willing to make them totally public, this Docker hub seems perfectly willing to just like host them for you. So you can just dump it there and it'll be easy for someone to just pull it down later. 
Um, I, it, the, the growth of tutorials and other information to, to learn about Docker um, has really been remarkable. There are really a lot of, of great tools. I put some of them on our, the resources page on our website. Um, I recommend, you know, trying it out and seeing whether you can just incorporate, whether you might want to incorporate, um, you know, running everything in a Docker container as part of your regular workflow. Try it out and see how it works compared to what you're doing now. I think also this mybinder.org effort is kind of a magical way to turn a GitHub repository with data and code into a Docker container containing your code and data in the cloud sort of with hardly any effort at all. It's um, kind of cool. But I'll, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll turn off the recording.